let's go to it. Uh, the content is a little bit I will talk about this, uh, and the, I will start with the history and the economy, and then digital sovereignty. Example is Gaia X, and there are a lot of other initiatives which are worth mentioning at the moment. A disclaimer, it's a little bit long, so uh, I will not read everything. So I am not working in the public sector. Uh, I'm just doing everything there for free. Uh, uh, in the moment, I make my money with uh, Kubernetes and especially Kubernetes security. So this is enough to uh, do a little bit of free work uh, in the public sector because it needs it and it is steering into that Kubernetes direction. And I will go through it and I will uh, explain what I'm doing in the moment or when it's important. So uh, a little bit of history. Um, I was part of the team in 2001, which promoted SUSE in the Deutsche Bundestag. We had partial success. And what we had to learn the hard way is that there is a lot of they are not interested in, in technology, at, at, at least at this time, nobody was interested. SUSE was um, a, is a Nuremberg-backed company and not even the um, member of parliament of that area and of that party have been any interest for, for SUSE. And um, we had a partial success means IBM made the money, SUSE uh, made the news or the, the headlines, and then uh, finally we um, received the notice that it has been stopped by a hard uh, lobbyist who is a member of the Atlantic Bridge uh, lobbying the car and the defense industry. So uh, we never, never before have met people uh, with such a destructive power. Uh, and outside the public sector, uh, open source developed quite well from the very early beginnings when, when uh, Carlos Computer Club in 1981 has been funded, everything was there, but they did not coin it uh, or frame it as op um, digital serenity. But if you read the, uh, um, the manifest, uh, it's very close to this. We had a lot of conferences here partially organized by uh, the team or the predecessor of the team, which is giving the conference here. We had the Linux talk. Uh, Chemnitz in Brussels, the first time. And in uh, 2002, 2006, and then Amazon started to uh, become big and wanted to have this um, cloud-like business. And they adapted Linux because it was all cheaper. So one of the first really huge commercial adoptions was quite uh, nearly 20 years ago. Today, uh, we have a lot of um, organizations uh, available. And uh, as you might have noticed, all the startups in Berlin are the not any more startups like Zalando, Immobilien Scout, or the Idealo, all the bigger things, I cannot name them all, are using uh, open source software. Kind of, uh, they are pro um, promoting open source, they have an uh, inner source uh, program, and it's, it's working quite well. If we talk about economy, uh, we have to know the standard pattern. So that's a, yeah, making money, capital accumulation, and uh, general pattern is you privatize the profits and socialize the losses. So uh, this is a, one of these common patterns which we really don't like, but it's you, you will face it everywhere. And you have a politics of interest, which is not even uh, easy to explain in English because politics of interest is always uh, economical framed in English. So it's kind of lobbyism. You have a lot of psychology, psychology, greed, fad, uh, and all the other things. And um, important, uh, it's all, sometimes it's important to um, know what is not mentioned. So this is called the Derrida deconstruction. I will present the slides with all the links in it, and we will see what this means uh, in a few minutes. Does money make open source go wrong? Here is an, a list of the last acquisitions in the open source business. So public um, open source companies have been bought by other, biggest one is Red Hat, bought by IBM, 34 billion. SUSE is uh, rumored that it will have an IPO this year, about 6 billion. Docker failed to uh, get acquired by Microsoft because uh, they 
didn't want it. Rancher has been acquired by Susan and so on. So you have, you have hundreds of millions of acquisitions in open source. So it looks like it is a big business. But on the other side, if you look what which companies had the mo most profit of open source, uh, Apple with the BSD kernel, Microsoft, which is uh, using uh, Canonical or Ubuntu software in, in, in its cloud, Amazon and Google, uh, they are uh, thousands of millions. So in, in uh, German, we have this uh, billion, in American, it's trillions, so don't mix it. And if you compare to the next bigger companies like Tesla, SAP, or in, in Germany, they are factor uh, of 10 or um, compared to the open source companies, factor of 50 bigger than the uh, open source companies. So open source, a billion in open source looks big, but compared to the big platforms or the hyperscalers, it's not a huge number. One side remark, uh, Germany always is proud of having found the, IP, um, the MP3 standard, but if you compare the money they uh, earn by patents then compared to the value of Spotify, so the platform versus uh, um, whether it's a patent uh, business, uh, it's a factor of 60. And other companies here uh, in Berlin, they have a few billion and they are considered as large companies, but uh, compared to the hyperscalers, uh, they are really small. And if you compare to the money which has been uh, held by private households in Germany, this is uh, now uh, even bigger, it's nearly seven billion or trillion for the Americans money. So it's a, it's a huge number. So what um, it does not look like that, that money is a problem, but we have another problem here, uh, which is the investment is not really uh, working well. So we had, uh, we are in the middle of the pandemic and even the most uh, prominent companies, CureVac and BioNTech, which are uh, now big uh, pharma business, they had difficulties to get money for uh, for their business. So they need to ask the government for investment and not the, the VC market. So the VC market in Europe is completely defined. So all the companies which are successful are bought by other uh, American funds. And uh, this is a big problem here that we cannot really um, do the, the funding on that big scale. This is a reason why the American platforms are so successful. Uh, we could do other things, of course, we could raise a taxes on property or um, tax uh, the big platforms like, Anava, um, like like Amazon, but as already it has been mentioned that, that raising the taxes uh, in Germany is, is quite hard. And this is not capitalism by, by its own, by the way you all so have big governmental investments which are going completely in the wrong direction. So what can we do uh, on that and uh, compared to what, what is the value of open source? What are, what are we contributing here? And, and, and here it only counts, not the social aspect, um, not we are free developers, sorry for that. I am really, very much uh, with, with this aspect. But here, uh, if we look into the hard numbers, we see uh, by the Linux Foundation survey, 35% of the developers are um, European based. And uh, we make a one third of the actual growth with the software in new products. And this, um, there's another study that 80 until 95% of some of these products are open source. So effectively, um, there is a quarter of the growth directly related to open source software in Europe. So we have to claim this uh, success and we have to uh, also claim some back for this money oh, we already made. So it's a newer study, quantification, which says we are making uh, every year in the open source business in Europe, 95 billion. So nearly 100 billion per year is a contribution to the GDP. So this is a big number and this is now uh, on the table and uh, politics is uh, really paying attention to it at the moment. But it's, Question is, do we pay the right attention? One of the guys uh, in the German open source business is Rafael de Laguna. Uh, he founded Open Exchange, 
uh, where he was CEO. Now he is uh, the founding director of the Sprint Bundesagentur für uh, for Sprung Innovation, and he is um, promoting open source on the, on the government level. There's an interview uh, and uh, what I very much like and what I don't like, for example, it's a Linux foundation. He's a pacifist at heart, I'm also. So if I'm not part of the open source business or one of the organizations, uh, bigger organization, because I have too much uh, promoting for the military business. And uh, the more or less uh, tipping point was this um, uh, 2019 in Leipzig, where the Christian Democratic Party had uh, their uh, yearly party talk, so they, and he could announce that uh, open source is now the government uh, politics. So, um, the, so the, the biggest party in Germany, which which the longest longest uh, tradition of, of governing, has now adopted open source, and they are framing it different. They are framing it. Digital is Wirtschaftswunder. So Wirtschaftswunder is one of the things you should uh, smile on, but it's effectively, it's um, a miracle uh, and it's a fairy tale. So don't believe in fairy tales, but it's a framing which says, okay, it's as relevant uh, as it can be for the German economy. There are other things uh, everybody wants to be on that list, uh, but this is more interesting for the German. Um, and, and behind the scenes, uh, there is uh, another motivation for going open source. We have been uh, had this um, Trump administration for four years, and uh, it really uh, threatened the independence of Europe. And, and um, there have been sanctions on, on decisions, if they are wrong or not, but the sanctions for, for things uh, where it should be sovereign was not recognized as a very positive sign. And then they immediately started in this uh, digital sovereignty, we will still have to define it, took off. And uh, yeah, the, the bigger thing uh, which was never mentioned in uh, the official news was that there was a fear of a potential cloud boycott. So sources in the German government told me that they have been afraid that not only the pipeline and the um, and technology boycotts on, on, the on, the, on the oil pipeline, not the data pipeline, the oil pipeline to Russia um, have been uh, threatened, uh, but also uh, there was uh, an, an embargo uh, under the hood um, that uh, Germany would be cut off the uh, cloud. So no Amazon, no Google, uh, no Facebook anymore. So this was one real threat. And then they uh, analyzed it and uh, there was a study, a strategic uh, market analysis reducing the dependency uh, on, on open so uh, of software uh, vendors. And it came out, surprise, surprise, they are heavily depending on uh, on software vendors, on proprietary software vendors. Another um, thread, another thread in the plot is uh, the data. So, so it's not only about open source; it's also about data. And in 2014 and uh, later, they framed this digital and data is a new oil. I absolutely hate this framing as a new oil because. Uh, what it's effectively meaning, you can see here, uh, you see, yeah, um, <laughs> what will be our deep water horizon? So this is not something uh, which is um, predictable. It already has happened. We see a lot of breaches and, and where uh, data is, somebody will try to catch it and, and to get out of it. And what we also see is that they commented a lot of uh, things. Uh, so the official um, uh, line of the government is not very uh, unam um, unambiguous. So somebody says, yeah, we want to have everything free and anything. And in the same, uh, same uh, department, they say, okay, we make this uh, IT security, uh, IT Sicherheitsgesetz uh, 
um, law which is effectively restricting uh, our freedom. Um, and these, uh, for, for all the non-Germans, these German surveillance fantasies are propagating to the Euro European level and come back and then they uh, go into law. This is not a big, uh, not, not a very friendly uh, approach on that. Uh, the role of the hyperscalers is very questionable. So uh, you have seen the value is in the trillions or um, German billions of money. And uh, what we also don't like is that uh, they are aggreg aggregating customer and partner data on a big scale. And Amazon is uh, very famous for squeezing partners out of the business. And Cory Doctorov calls the um, Amazon ecosystem, the kill zone. So effectively, our entire economy will be killed because of these uh, business practices. And um, we had seen notorious GDPR violations, the Cloud Act, um, and customers are forced into the cloud. For example, the Office 365 disaster, which is uh, completely cutting us off from, from running our own version, even, even if we have paid for the proprietary solution. So this is not really uh, something which is acceptable. And another thing uh, which does not work is, is everything about intellectual property. So intellectual property has failed on nearly every scale from very big, a few uh, line, a few notes in, a, in music to Disney laws to, um, patents on um, in uh, in the industry. So uh, and together with with uh, code and data, this means who owns the code, who owns the data. I think this is an unsolvable problem, and this is all going to be addressed at the moment. Um, so we have intrinsic arguments here against intellectual property. So intrinsic means only business uh, arguments. Um, uh, it's an ineffective method of control. It's slow. Um, it is not really um, making, giving us anything. You have seen the Fraunhofer MP3 example. Fraunhofer has split in separate parts. There are parts they say we cannot open source our code because it weakens our patterns. You say, see the entire framing at the moment is completely wrong. So other parts of Fraunhofer support open source and, and uh, it's a transition. You see this kind of, of uh, transition in business everywhere. And this is one of these strategic market analysis. So they, they say uh, in, in, a, in a PDF, uh, yeah, we are depending on Microsoft and other software providers. And this is something I, I just linked it if you want to read it, but uh, this is what we told them 20 years ago. Okay, these are consultants. Yeah, they are paid a lot. And uh, here is a positive thing. So now I will talk about digital sovereignty and sovereignty itself is quite difficult wording. So in, in, in the US, sovereignty is related a little bit to uh, the extreme right. If you don't take care, and in this case, digital sovereignty means um, the best def definition I have seen here is from Peter Gansen. It's a concept uh, that you, as an individual, an organization, or a state, are uh, allowed to determine where you want to um, place your personal data and how it should be uh, used. And this is this is uh, something which is absolutely compatible even to the Chaos Computer Club. It's, this is this is uh, working in a way that we can say, okay, this is a, a definition we can um, can uh, work on, and this is a definition we can really use even in our contracts. And he has declared four principles. I think it's a little bit analog to the four freedoms of the GPL, and um, yeah, you need the right uh, to store the data wherever you want. It should be, there should be standards. Um, the standards should be open source. Um, and the cloud services must be in a way that you follow the principles of the internet. The so open systems uh, must be interconnected without 
uh, the need and the consent of a central authority. And education is a big part of the concept. So uh, you really need to educate people on it. And then uh, one of these outcomes was this project Gaia X. So this is uh, our Bundesminister Altmaier. So he's the Secretary of State in the um, Department of Business or of Economy and, and Energy. And they very much claimed, here yeah, we have uh, this uh, digital summit and now we are promoting it. And, and uh, he's missing on this photo because uh, he was so excited about this new step that he immediately had an accident and uh, fall off the, the stairs and then he was not able to attend. What you also see is um, there is a lot of, um, a lot of people here who not really contributed to uh, the digital development of Germany. Um, worst guy is, uh, um, uh, is a official, one of the official di di digital ministers of so telecommunication and traffic. And uh, here is uh, the reality in Germany, 70 kilometers away from this digital summit. The fastest way of transporting data is uh, by horse with uh, which um, DVD on it, and um, by using the by, by um, promoting the internet in Mecklenburg Vorpommern in the east in East Germany, um, they have effectively cut off the telephone lines because uh, the line the digital uh, wireless networks uh, the um, phone network is so weak that you cannot carry voice over IP, and then some parts uh, of Eastern Germany have really no access to the internet, which is a catastrophe in the times of a pandemic. Okay, uh, the next step was, uh, yes, uh, as uh, Julia already mentioned, there is no uh, single country which can govern uh, open source process. So first invitation always goes to France and uh, so uh, the outcome is an European initiative. So it's uh, at the end, it will be uh, an uh, AISBL. So it's uh, by Belgian law, it's a Association Internationale Sans but Lucratif. And you have 22 founding members uh, from the industry. So uh, this means um, it's not a government run uh, project anymore. It's an industry run project. And this is very much constructed after the way um, the German internet is constructed. So the D6 is also um, a, a German Genossenschaft. So it's a, also a non profit organization. And they build all the backbones and the internet uh, traffic in Germany. It, it works quite well. And uh, yeah, you will have your 300 day one members, which means um, there is a big support by the German uh, and the European industry. So it's, uh, it's really um, on an industrial scale. And you see all the, uh, all the participants. I've worked for seven of them, uh, not related with Gaia X, but uh, yeah, so this is more or less good representation. But also uh, this Palantir, and it's not the Drupal Palantir, it's a Palantir which is uh, uh, responsible for the surveillance everywhere, uh, wanted to attend, which means to, uh, we needed a clarification. So the clarification here is definitely is this, is uh, everybody has one vote. If you are in this ISBL, and if you are Google, or if you are a small company, um, you have, this, the same number of votes, which is exactly one. So if Palantir wants to join and they can join, then they have exactly one vote uh, and not cannot dominate. Even if the big uh, cloud, uh, if the hyperscalers would attend, they only would have one voice. So politics, we already mentioned what is Gaia X, by the way, you see a lot of uh, interesting colored slides. And here it is about the data spaces. It's about connecting data and software. And here is uh, where I feel a little bit more family effectively. It's an open stack cluster or some platform. 
And there's kind of uh, Kubernetes on top of it with all the network uh, issues and the connections. Um, so this is where why I feel home in the Gaia X project. So I know uh, most of the technologies, and uh, this is quite uh, an interesting technology stack. It's it's quite complicated, but it works. And uh, here you see what they intend. They want to have a federated system of independent clouds. And they can have different levels from a very public level to a very uh, isolated level. And they all can, can be interconnected in a very, very defined way. So your data can flow from your hospital into a cloud provider's data center in a very defined and protected flow. This is the intention behind it. And there is um, the sovereign cloud stack, which is more or less a hello world of Gaia-X. It is uh, on GitHub. And the people who brought it there are um, it's more or less um, the creme de la creme of the German open source um, developer. So Kurt Garloff is the main driver. And he was one of the kernel developers at SUSE. And, and Peter Ganten and the other also contribute a lot of the politics and the code in this project. What else? Uh, there's a demonstrator. You can click it. it. It effectively feels like Linux in 1991. So uh, this makes me 30 years uh, younger. So uh, I like it, but it's definitely not um, finished yet. It will be available end of the year. We will have, uh, um, there are already demonstrators how it works. So please try it out. Um, and uh, if you are able to contribute, please contribute. Another thing uh, which uh, is quite interesting uh, was the Corona app. So uh, effectively, the highest instance of uh, computer security uh, is not uh, um, is not an official institution, but it's the Chaos Computer Club. It has an absolutely um, veto blocking power. So if they don't like your solution and can crack it in, in a live session, um, it's done. So it happened to the German uh, EID, the Personalausweis, uh, and here with this uh, activity for in, in the German Corona app, they uh, gain more or less the, the, the highest uh, level of support. So uh, Chaos Computer, Computer Club said, uh, we cannot complain. So uh, this is more or less uh, what you need. And then uh, the initiatives uh, took off. So this is one. This is another of the German Digital uh, Secretary of State. This is Markus Richter, CIO Bund. He is uh, more or less the CIO of the German uh, government uh, computing. So uh, and he is driving a lot of initiatives. Christina Lang, um, uh, she's a co-founder of Tech for Germany. It's supported from another. Uh, Digital uh, Secretary of State, Kanzler Amtsminister, so the, the highest um, people in, in Germany support at the moment open source. And this is quite necessary because the biggest project I know of at the moment is the online Zugangsgesetz, so it's an online access law. It's a um, law which uh, requires that every uh, Bundesland, every country in, in Germany, and every uh, contributor puts one of these um, building blocks of the entire German administration uh, into an open source project. So this is a real huge open source project. And uh, it must everything must be open source. And it's based on Kubernetes. So you see a lot of microservices here. And if you have ever worked in a bigger microservice problem, this means we have you have a real huge distributed system, 600 uh, services which turns out to be whatever, a few thousand uh, different micro, uh, different containers. Uh, there is, it, it enforces automatically um, the different organizations, CI, CD pipelines, uh, security process changes, everything you need. Uh, you have to address a tech vector because this will be a first class target. And uh, this does not work without open source. And everybody knows that, that it's, it's not pro uh, possible to build this with proprietary solutions. 
So, um, yeah, this is the standard control council. They complained a lot of the government in Germany. This is something I've been part of. Uh, this, there will be a governmental code report, not because we uh, are not um, able to use GitHub, but because we have, uh, as Julia already mentioned, um, we have to lower the barrier to contributions. This means uh, every, it should be easy for everybody in the German administrat administration to contribute to code, to, to take code, and it should be legally compliant. Um, and there should be uh, everything integratable. It could be integrated in GAIA-X. It will be open, um, of course. Um, it will be another open source repository where, you, where the German government hopefully will guarantee that this uh, code which is there is compliant to all the rules and all the laws and then it can be reused in Europe and we will also reuse a lot of code from other European countries. And um, already in the news is the planning for the center of digital sovereignty. I am um, disclaimer I'm under NDA but what you can read in the news already uh, without me breaking the NDA is that it will be a um, very huge OSPO and it will be uh, um, have a lot of uh, connections to all other OSPOs and open source projects without taking over uh, open source projects. It, it cannot really control everything, but it will be a big and, and first stop for all um, projects which have relations to the government in the near future. Another thing, personally, because I like uh, also uh, the approach of getting independent of, uh, of the hardware dependencies, um, the RISC V uh, project is taking off in Europe uh, because NVIDIA has acquired ARM for 40 billion. It's hardware, so, so therefore I did not mention it. Intel more or less is in a burnout state. Uh, it's more or less not usable anymore in a security aware environment. And uh, RISC-V will be an independent architecture because RISC-V architecture is under the PSD license. So we can use it and there are European initiatives uh, which will be hopefully in the next few years lead to completely independent hardware. So hopefully see processors, supercomputer processors, which are faster than what we see at the moment from the big contributors um, in 2024. What is missing? Uh, not everything is, um, is uh, under open source and some of the promises are, are still broken. Even the German health system, Gematic, is delivering, but not everything, I, I think. And what is um, not delivered at the moment is the source code of the Bundesdruckerei. They are responsible for all the passport uh, systems and uh, they try behind the scenes because they are uh, controlled by secret services in Germany uh, to, get, to keep as much control uh, as possible. And this will be, um, it's a little bit sad because uh, some of these uh, Initiatives to get your passport on your mobile phone should and must be open source. And uh, otherwise, uh, they will be broken. And I'm looking forward to the talks where somebody on stage is going to break it and uh, to break out of the secure Samsung containers. It's a challenge, but uh, I'm, so what I've seen so far is that there are people who will make a PhD thesis out of it. So the conclusions at the moment. Yeah, um, open source is um, going big in uh, business now and accepted by the government. But we see a lot of progress. We are in the transition phase. We have many gaps. Public, public sector is an absolutely brown field, so there is no something we can write new code from scratch. Um, projects are struggling, but not by technical issues. Um, even individual efforts can have a big impact. If you promote it to the right person, uh, you will be invited to a board where you can decide. So uh, stay tuned. 
Um, fighting for this kind of data sovereignty is a big driver in the German government at the moment. We see a lot of progress, a lot of building areas, uh, and it's important. So, yeah, that's what I wanted to tell you. If you want to contact me, uh, I will be in the breakout session after this. Let's, uh, let's go and um, I'm happy to hear your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for your talk. Um, yes, there is actually there is one question. Maybe we can do that real quick um, before we go over to the uh, breakout room. Um, someone asked, what do you think is the way forward? Is it projects like Gaia X or if it's not, um, what do you think is missing at the moment? Uh, I think Gaia X is a big progress because now we can build our own clouds. So we don't have to wear the T-shirts. The cloud is just another guy's computer. Um, now we will have we will be able to build our own cloud in a separate environment. It's like Linux in 1991. Nobody would have believed that somebody could clone the Unix kernel and make a public project out of it. Nobody would have believed it at the time, but it, it happened. And the complexity is immense, but we will handle it and we will learn it. And the other things which are lacking, uh, yeah, we will see. We have to, uh, now we can make the pressure. Um, if the official institutions uh, are on board and if somebody in the government asks why is the software for your, your ID card not public, you need a reason for that. 